All right. Thanks for making it back after lunch. Um, right now, Reich Flöter will talk to us about modernizing RelayD and the, dare I say, rocky road to HTTP2. Please welcome Reich. Thank you. Yeah, okay. It's, uh, it's great to see you here, especially after lunch. I think I had a plate with that much meat and fish and all that, and now I have to talk. So, we'll see. I hope it's worth it. So, let me talk about modernizing RelayD and a little bit about HTTP2 um, and why the focus of this talk shifted a little bit to, to uh, other things we did in RelayD over the last few months. Um, by the way, this people rarely know that RelayD has its own uh, Puffy mascot version that I once did myself. It's a plumber, the the pluffer, uh, plumber Puffy um, that you see in the corner. So, a little history lesson about RelayD, and in the in the latest context. Then I will talk about some new features and enhancements uh, or things that have been requested many times over the years and I finally unslacked and, and uh, fixed or finished them uh, about HTTP2 and what is being worked on there and some, some other future stuff. And then I hope you, you have some questions after, afterwards. So, RelayD got imported in 2006, so it's almost ancient now. Um, and it was an interesting um, piece of code because I wrote a little daemon that was able to do health checks on, on different web servers, like using ICMP checks or TCP checks or a little uh, HTTP check. And then based on the health check results, uh, configure a PF table. To, so in the, back in the days, we had these RDRs in PF, and the RDRs could only forward uh, to a round-robin table. So PF got the request and uses the round-robin table to send this to a backend host. And this was static. So if one of the hosts in this table was down, PF did it anyway. So the little idea was just do health checks and based on that, po populate the table. And then about the same time, um, Pierre Yves showed up. And he has or had implemented uh, something very similar, this SLBD, simple load balancing daemon, that he did, um, and it was the same idea, and it had a few, few more things that I didn't have in my implementation, and, and he lacked others. So it's like, oh great, let's import uh, this, this load balancing daemon, I convinced Theo, and we can also get a new developer, because we also imported Pierre Eve in the project, basically. So, Based on that, we, we, we worked on the code, <laughs> made it ready for the tree, and this, uh, because I didn't like the name Slibbit, rename, rena renamed it to even worse uh, thing, to, um, oh my gosh, what, what, oh, it was host state D in the beginning. And, and this, yeah, that was the famous first comment with many to-dos. So, it got in in 2006. In 2007, um, so in the beginning it was basically just running health checks and then configuring PF for this, as I say, redirect, so the, the layer three forwarding. Um, but then I got asked um, myself by somebody who, who wanted to, to run an, a load balancer in a, in a big web uh, application. It was a platform where you could buy streams from 
uh, German soccer games and all that, and this Magenta company was involved there, and they asked, oh, can you do load balancing, and do you support um, SSL termination? And I said, sure, and then I looked it up, and implemented it, actually, and this is how RelayD got support for the, the, the relays, the la layer seven uh, part. So the difference is, one thing, I can terminate TL TLS connection on the front and talk HTTP to the backend. So this requires me to, to go on all on uh, the uh, application layer now, right? So this is basically SSL termination. And this particular product as well as good because it was, a, it was a free load test basically because thousands of people at the same time wanted to order their soccer game that they could watch online and all that. And I was sitting in the data center with, with some people watching the game and at the same time see, oh, Relay D crashed. Okay, let's fix it, run it again. And so it was kind of live uh, testing. The good thing is we had RelayD redundant, so if one crashed, the other one took over and nobody noticed any problems. So this is how RelayD got the relay part. If you know the syntax, it has redirects and relays. So the relay parts came a few months later. Um, you can do a little bit more, so for example, instead of just doing the load balancing based off on source IP, what PF basically does, you can look at, at the cookie value so that you maintain some persistence. So if, if a client uh, provides a specific uh, cookie, you send it to, to the same backend, or you hash in some other values to make it less obvious for, for some attackers, basically. So um, this is all part of the layer seven. Over the time, it got renamed multiple times. SLBD in the beginning, as I said, host state D, which I never really liked. It was a compromise. Host state D, we thought it as clever until some Americans told me that uh, the first part is not really a good idea. And the last thing, uh, I came up with the name Relay D, which because it is more than just something that monitors the state of servers, it is relaying from A to B. And I even like a relay, the name, more than like proxy, because a proxy is usually very application specific. And a relay is very generic. RelayD can do generic TCP, but it can also do TLS and HTTP. So getting stuff from A to B in the middle. You know, that's what RelayD does. And a few years later, um, RelayD got an offspring, basically, when we removed Nginx from OpenBSD, and uh, we, we needed um, a, another web server. I said, okay, I can re turn RelayD into a web server because it already has part of the implementation, right? So HTTP is its own piece of software, but it's based on RelayD still, and it tried to sync code back and forth. Okay, long history. Um, but meanwhile, in 2019, <laughs> the web has changed a bit, right? So everything is distributed and everything is like cloud and apps and whatever, and people don't even use real web servers anymore. You have some Node.js and whatever is fancy right now. Um, so we, we see, okay, we need to clean it a little bit up um, technically, like, like Claudius changed to use libtls instead of OpenSSL. That's just a detail, but this enables us to use modern uh, TLS versions, basically, yeah? um, or SNI later. And, but still, what really the lacked or lacked partially is do some filtering for the requests, blocking based on source IP, things like that, or um, assume uh, forward to a backend where, where the nodes have different ports. Uh, this is one thing that in the, in, the, in the past you had like a pool of web servers and all of them had their own IP. And, and 
but all of them were running on port 80, and now this is not the case anymore if you have some whatever Docker farm and, uh, and things like that. Yeah. So this already existed in a way in uh, 2007 that there were some, I think, Ruby frameworks where you run the services on, on some weird ports and then some front end uh, forwards it, but I always said, that's stupid, who does it, right? Uh, so we never supported it. Um, yeah, so it's about small features that we added and then that are av available now. And then the biggest thing to add is just we're running on an old version of, of the HTTP protocol, right? RelayD is still HTTP 1.1 only. It, it works in most of the cases. I mean, there's no regression yet, but... It, it can be better, it can be maybe faster and all that with HTTP 2. So in May, I decided to, to have a hackathon with myself. So I went to the Kraftwerk, which is kind of a cafe, co-working kind of thing, and sit on my chair and was hacking there. And people were looking at me, what is he doing there every day? And so I had my one big hackathon where I implemented first some of the obvious things and, uh, yeah, some, some others. So one thing is, that was actually a bug. I knew about this bug. It was a little bit hard to fix, but I finally did it. So RelayD has, so you have the relay statement, usually a listen on and a forward to, so one side, the other side. And then you can attach a protocol to it for, well, for the, in this case, the HTTP filters. So in the past, um, the problem was, so I added this possibility based on a backend or on a, on a URL path to switch the backend, which is very common, right? You have a website and it has static content like slash images or slash static, and you want to serve this from the whatever small static web server, and then you have all the dynamic stuff you want to serve from your Node.js, Go, Rust, whatever web application. So um, in order to do this, you have to write a, um, such a filter, and then you can switch the, the backend. It only contains one IP here right now, but it can be a pool of multiple hosts as well. So the problem is, this didn't really work because RelayD took in a keep alive session, like HTTP uh, keep alive, a persistent connection. It, it selected the back end for the first request, and then um, this was sticky, right? And then it kept on using the selected uh, back end for all connections of the same, of all requests of the same connections. Now I have it. So the workaround was really terrible, basically enforce a connection to close for each request. So the, like in the old time, like one request per TCP connection. This worked, but it was not a nice way. So I fixed this finally to be able to, to remove this, and now you can really use, use this feature to have multiple server backends. Um, in order to use it, it only works with tables right now, but as I said, you can put one IP address in there. And there's, there's some special implementation details, so you have one listen on and one or more forward two rules. So the first one is always the default that gets selected. The other ones are kind of ignored unless you, you're selected with a rule but you have to define them here as well. Uh, you can also add a health check statement there. If, if not, then their hosts are always online. So this is working now also like since May. Um, the from two filter <laughs> rules is something that I added. Actually, the code was all partially there in RelayD and I never finished it somehow and I forget I forgot about it. But now you can, you can write these rules and specify source destination matching syntax so that you, 
you give a specific URL only to, to internal hosts and things like that, yeah? So you can, so it's, yeah, I know, it looks a little bit like PF, right? It is not PF, it, people said, is it really wise to use the same syntax? And I said, well, it is an application layer firewall <coughs> in a way, yeah? So this is possible now, you can also block based on IPs or network ranges and things like that. And it's evaluated in last matching order, of course. SNI. So, if you ever looked at OpenSSL itself and how SNI, the server name indication, is implemented, if you, if you, if you use the library, it is kind of a mess, right? You, you have multiple SSL objects and you somehow need to, to deal with this, with some callbacks and all that. And so, in LibreSSL, we have libtls, which is a really nice TLS library that is, sits on top of the libssl library, but it's really easy to use, it is it's safe, it's nicely designed. I, I wonder myself, why is it uh, such a rare thing? Not so many people are using libtls. Yeah? I think libtls is one of the main advantages of LibreSSL. It's a really nice library. Just, just try to use it. You can make a TLS server with just a few lines. It's very easy to use. Uh, and there are some, we used it with Rust as well and all that because it's also very easy to integrate libtls in other languages and you don't have to deal with all this OpenSSL mess. So libtls made it easier to add SNI support and SNI basically means, instead of having one server certificate, the server has a default certificate once again, but it can select a different certificate based on the server name that is sent as part of the TLS header, or it's an extension. Yeah. Um, so now you, you can... By default, RelayD, you don't have to configure your TLS. It looks up the, the, when you do SSL, it looks up the TLS in a magic pass, yeah? ETC SSL, then uh, the relay.key and, and, and things like that. So it's documented in the MAN page. But now you can configure multiple ones and it, will, it still uses this pass, ETC SSL and so on, as documented, but then with the specified base name, file name. So you add multiple ones and then if they match, it uses a different key. Very easy to configure actually. Just, just drop in the new, new keys and, and add a line for each and, and then your SNI works. And then in the back end, your web servers can actually deal with the different host and, and all that. I wonder who has looked up this IP address yet, but anyway. <laughs> OCSP, another thing, HTTPD got OCSP support like some time ago, it's even mentioned in the um, HTTPD and RelayD mastery book, shameless plug, uh, from Michael W. Lukers. Um, so there he mentions and describes how to use OCSP with HTTPD. This is code that Bob Beck added. And now I finally got this over to RelayD. It's a little different syntax because RelayD has this, here you see the magic pass again. So when there's a file .ocsp, either for name and port or just name, then it will use this. So the OCSP is basically, oh, I'm, I'm not a TLS person per se, but it basically means you, you ask the web, web server and the web server can give you a signed um, OCSP response from, from the CA that says, tells you about the validity of the certificate. It's OCSP stapling. And so when you do that, it, it really, you don't see a functional difference, but it makes it easier for your clients to look up the validity of the certificate and then fasten things up because you don't have to do an external request to them. Um, uh, OCSP server or use a re revocation list or something like this. 
So the road to HTTP2, it started really nicely. I took this picture from a motorcycle trip this year. So yeah, you have some stones and it's rocky and all that, but on the other side you have the beautiful view on this is Vierwaldstätter See, right? So it looked like that. And okay, it's like, okay, I did these features on my list and then I started, well, we do need HTTP2 support after some time. Like OpenBSD very often is, and we get asked about a new thing. We say, no, that's terrible. We don't do this. Like uh, ACPI, ooh, it's a terrible thing, and APM works great, right? So we didn't get ACPI until somebody implemented ACPI, and with a lot of work, we have a really nicely working ACPI stack. The good thing with ACPI was we didn't drink the Kool-Aid and we didn't get the reference code. We have like a really nice and working implementation. The same happened there with VMD, right? We, hypervisors and VMs are bad, but now we have a really nice implementation that uh, contains VMs much better than QMO does, uh, and, and so on. And with HTTP2, we said this is HTTP, P, HTTP2 and these, um, uh, what was the previous name? Excuse, uh, I just lost it. Skippy? Yeah. Skip. Speedy, Speedy. Yeah, why do I think Skippy? Yeah, Speedy, Speedy. So Speedy was, yeah, was basically this in the beginning. Speedy had one major difference, how it compressed the headers. But you say, oh, okay, all these additional states and multiplexing, that looks very dangerous, right? So I think it, it's very easy to make it wrong. So we were skeptical about this. Um, but I said, okay, now it's time actually. 2019 is the time since HTTP 3 is, is it already standardized or they plan to do it this year? I'm not sure if the RFC is out yet. But so since we get HTTP 3 now, HTTP 2 is vintage computing, so let's implement it, right? So um, I started working on it, but, but because it needs so many changes in, in Relay, the, I started something very nasty. Instead of sending millions of patches around on, on OpenBSD lists, I started just moving ahead, doing stuff, and then later when I feel confident enough, I, I will share it and, and incrementally, not in one block. But instead of doing this just silently on my own, I said, okay, I shared this GitHub, you can follow it, but this is like work in progress code, right? Um, so HTTP2 is multiplexed, multi-stream protocol, that's a major difference. It is using header compression and it's a small binary protocol. So instead of like opening a telnet and typing get HTTP2 or whatever, or NC, you know, you, you basically have the same, you have the headers, but they are all encoded. So it's, it's a binary protocol for the headers and for the communication itself. One thing that they did, all headers are lowercase now, and they defined some standard headers that the most common ones with these colon syntax. So method is now a header, not something of the string anymore, and authority used to be the host header, but you can still add arbitrary headers below that, like user agent or your own X organization and all that. So I'm not going too much into the HTTP2 details, but one thing, for example, is RelayD was written in a way that it expects request response. Or actually it does support pipelining in a way that the client sends multiple requests and then you answer these requests in the same order. So it's um, possibility in HTTP 1. It's broken in many cases, but it's still, they try to solve some issues with it and it never really worked. But usually it's still the same request response scheme, even if you just make it in chunks. But HTTP 2, like one client connection, like a single TCP TLS connection, can, uh, can open multiple streams, and this totally asynchronously. So you open a connection to your web server, and the web server can push responses to you, basically. 
because there's some picture like the logo of, of the company you're accessing the website that you might need. So it's just sending you the logo without you ever asking, right? That's one feature. Or you, you can have this one connection and then start multiple streams um, connection uh, requesting different things like the CSS and the, the JavaScript and the page all at the same time over one connection and then the server sends the responses in in, in frames in, in packets with their stream ID so you know where they belong but they arrive totally out of order it doesn't matter anymore so you just need one connection and you can also send your DNS requests over it right and so it's all going there so Relay-D was not designed for this. So one word, this is actually a branch in my, my code because it's, I need to merge it in at some point, but it's, it's a lot of mechanical work in the tree. I had to split like one main structure that was used for the relaying request response. I had to split it into like a peer, like one side, and then multiple streams to it so that like one peer can have multiple streams, and so the way, so you can directly access some fields like the peer address anymore, and then you, you, you look, look it up and see. So this is large diff, actually, and I'm really scared about getting this in, but I get an okay Benno, and then it's, it's all fine. Yeah. Um, okay, oh, well, I still have time. HPAC. So I talked about header compression. So this whole thing, this HTTP header, is doing header compression. Actually, in, in Speedy, they, I think they used deflate or something, and it was vulnerable to, what was it, crime attack. So, so in HTTP2, they use this HPAC algorithm. And actually, I, after looking at it, it's a really nice idea. Yeah. Let's just think about it. You have a persistent connection where you send multiple requests. So some headers like pass slash is something that repeats all the time. So HPEC allows to reduce it to one byte, just in a, in a static table, in an index. And you have other common, these colon headers, very common combinations where they just index, and then you encode it like this. And then other things that might be your, your, your string, like user agent. The user agent is usually a very large thing, but it never changes. So when you have one connection where you do 100 requests, you only need to send this user agent once. Then HPAC adds it to a dynamic table. And then the next request only sends you an, an index in this table. So instead of the huge string for the second subsequent request, in any of the streams in this, uh, you only send like the ID 127 or something like this. Yeah. So that's a very simplified description of how HPAC works. Yeah. So you index well known headers and you learn other headers dynamically during a connection. So the request size of the headers can be stripped down to just a few bytes. So I implemented HPEG. Um, it's not in OpenBSD yet because there's no use case for it, but the plan is to, to use this in RelayD and later HTTPD for the HTTP2 code. So it's, it's C code. I looked at existing implementations, but usually it's like, yeah, it doesn't really fit. And actually, it was a nice experience implementing this stuff. Um, and I looked at the, I mean, it's always with algorithms, right? People learn algorithms are things you have to do very smart and you have to invent your own algorithms to make them even better. But all these tricks are really scary once you do multiple loops and, and pointer arithmetics and all that. So I said, okay, my implementation, I think I want it to be fast, but the goal is not to optimize it as much as possible. The goal is to make the code somehow readable and obvious. So even if I allocate more data or my, my whatever, my space complexity is a little bit more than it could be, uh, the idea is to, to have this a really solid piece of software. So smart tricks are all, always dangerous. 
And I also want to utilize some like, like Otto's malloc tricks, for example, uh, like uh, free zero and things like that. So, so this is the year also online. Uh, the thing is, I, I spent some days running AFL fuzzing on my code. And I have like hundreds of test cases to verify it. Actually, AFL, after running for like 10 hours, found one really hard to find bug, and, and I was able to, to fix it. So I'm thankful for, for that. Yeah, so it evolved into a little API. So it's part of the man page. So you see, I even wrote a man page and all that. So it sits there, nobody uses it, but it intends to be clean so that we can integrate it later. Um, yeah, but this is basically it. We have HPAC, we have the streams, something that works with it. And I can parse maybe the first HTTP2 request, but then after I submitted this talk, actually the last months I yeah, had some changes, so I couldn't really much focus on, on continuing this work. So is it vaporware? No, it is not, because there's already some code, and we have time. I mean, really, the existence 2006, so we have time until 2026 or whatever to add HTTP2 support, but I'm, I'm still working on this, yeah? Um, by the way, this is a tunnel in Glarus in, in Switzerland as well. So I have some initial code. You see these magic HTTP2 preface. That's what they sent over after you negotiated HTTP2 with this uh, TLS uh, RLPN. You can switch to it, so it is compatible that you support both protocols. And then the first packet is this weird preface. I don't really know why they're doing this, because it's static, but it's part of the protocol. And then you have, you have the basic header, some kind of TLV, right? The stream IDs and then each packet. So there are different ones like data, but headers as well, the, the HPAC compressed headers, and then some, some other packets that, that you don't have in an HTTP one world. world. I like go away. I think that's still from the speedy Google days. Um, but also the scary ones like window update and all that. So that reminds me a bit of TCP, right? And that's the whole goal of like, removing control from the OS and moving it to the browser by, by doing things like that. Um, and ping is a heartbeat, for example. I'm not sure how dangerous this is. But then, in just a month ago, there was this, uh, this list of CVEs, right? You've probably saw on all web servers. 10 minutes, OK, yeah. Um, and because all HTTP2 implementations out there are vulnerable to, to denial of service attacks and all that because they didn't get the multiplexing right, they have uh, resource exhaustion attacks and all that. All the things we were concerned about back in the days, right? So we were right and they were wrong. And so we, we can try to make it right now, uh, learn from these mistakes and implement it properly. The thing is, some of these issues are really related to the protocol itself, so you really need to work around this, but it's possible. So I'm really glad that this happened before we finished the implementation. So quick, now, just quickly, is HTTP2 over TLS over UDP or DTLS? And this is HTTP3, yay. TCP is dead, who needs this? It is a UDP-based protocol that you cannot really firewall anymore, uh, but the standard now. So, um, of course, you can still block it. Yeah, you, you have UDP port 
is it 443? I think it's something you, so you can block the quick port. And I'm doing this on my firewall, so so they they go to to the uh, HTTP ports. Um, but this is basically the same protocol with the main difference that the HPAC algorithm got a little bit changed. And this makes sense because HPAC has some state and it expects the individual request to arrive in order, what happens on a TCP connection. But now with, with Quick, they can arrive out of order and then it, uh, the HPAC might cause head of line blocking where you wait for a specific state to, to advance. But otherwise, I have to admit, once we have HTTP2, it might not be too difficult to add, add quick support, but no, we're not doing this. Yeah. Um, okay, that's about almost the last slide. R real AD, so let's rewrite it in Rust because that's what everyone do is doing now. Actually, I do start to like Rust, but yeah, I'm kidding, really, seriously. Um, I did implement MG in, in Rust, RMG, after they announced Emacs in Rust, R Emacs, a serious project. I made my not so serious project RMG. But this is uh, basically on my roadmap. There's not so much I know right now. I think HTTP2 is the most important thing. We did get a few other features, like new binary health checks, I know, and some WebSockets compatibility. So we got some user-contributed patches into RealAD as well. Yeah, just keep on sending them. So for the questions, if we still have a minute, yeah, we do. I would also like to ask you right now, what do you think is needed these days for a load balancer, or what can you do with another load balancer like Nginx um, that you cannot do with Relady? Uh, I will utter the evil words like uh, full routing domain support. So you can run multiple Relady's in multiple uh, or different routing domains. It's still not there. Um, yes. I have a patch. I, I have a patch now for about uh, half a year or maybe, yeah, like this, that allows one relay D to, to, to run in multiple R domains and relay between them and all that. And I think I have to upstream this patch somehow. It's not too long. Yeah, I have to really, this, this, this is a good thing. I, I, I should remember just uh, digging out this, this patch and, and to do this. I really want it as well. I actually used it, but then I didn't have time to polish it up and release it. Uh, I, had, I was using VMD where multiple VMs were running in different routing domains, and then I had a relay in the front end to, to do some like TLS termination per routing domain. And for that, I had exactly this problem. Yeah. Hey, uh, I didn't know really understand how the RealAD works with HTTP2 on the back end. So I get it correctly that the RealAD supports is supposed to support HTTP2 in the front end, as in terminating the HTTP2. Yeah. But can I also use it to uh, like establish new HTTP connection to downstream, to the upstream? Sorry. Oh, th that's that's a good question. So he asks, yes. what do I do with HTTP2 support in the back end? On the, on the talking to the server, not in the, in the front-end part, right? Well, the basic idea of HTTP2 is more or less, if you look at it, it it's bidirectional. So you open a connection, and of course you want data from, from the server, but every site can make push or, or a request. So it, it's, it's not such a big difference talking from a client to the server then from a server to the client because the handshake is almost the same and then all that. So my plan is first on working on the relay D's server side to the outside. And then, yeah, in the beginning, it would 
have to most probably, that's in my POC that does one request, I'm talking uh, HTTP one to the inside. But in the end, it doesn't really matter. I mean, RelayD, for example, long before we had AF2 and PF, supports NAT64. It can do six, uh, IPv6 on the outside, V4 on the inside. So just generally, it doesn't really matter. You, you can use different protocols, and then the relay can <coughs> translate it. But the plan is first accepting HTTP2 and doing HTTP1 on in the inside. I wanted to ask about uh, the tooling for debugging HTTP2 connections on OpenBSD. What would you use? What would you probably need to implement, for instance, that you, I mean, nowadays you just netcat to, to a server and, you know, write in it in, in the text, mm. but it, that probably isn't really possible uh, anymore. So are you thinking about writing some tool that you could like plug between netcat and you and that would like create this binary uh, stuff? Well, maybe even the streams and stuff, uh, so you can actually test it with something that is, yeah, scriptable. Well, one thing, when Google did Speedy, they did one thing right, because they defined Speedy to be TLS only. So there is no plain text version of Speedy. And then the committees came in and they said, oh, we need HTTP2 over a TCP as well. And I, I'm not sure if, even, I think the browsers didn't want to implement it. I'm not sure if they do it now or not. But in theory, at least that was the design, you cannot netcat it because it's TLS always. And I think it's a good idea. I don't plan to support HTTP2 over TCP at this point. Because, well, it could, but that's not the idea. The idea was that it's always TLS. So then you cannot netcat it. So how do I debug it? Well, <laughs> I don't know, printfs and all that. You could probably, I mean, uh, in, in ICD we had something like this, or ISAC MPD, you, the daemon could put it into a PCAP format that you can use TCP dump on it, but, yeah. Sorry, just a plug, if you, if you extended Netcat with uh, libtls, because it's so nice and easy and whatnot, then uh, you could basically establish a TLS connection using Netcat, uh, and then, uh, so you do you, a the, man the, in the then, middle. then you would have a basis for for debugging, awesome. maybe, or or use something you can different try to if ride you a prefer patch. to modularize it uh, better. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe it would be an interesting thing to do this SSL man in the middle in Netcat. Okay. Other questions? Do we still have a minute? One more question or something like this? Yeah. yeah. One last question. Okay. Yeah. Otherwise, thank you very much. Benno. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's very courageous to come to Norway and show me the tunnel and stuff. Who is not here? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but the, the, the Gotthard tra the train tunnel is, is much longer. You should check out the Norwegian tunnels, is what I'm saying. <laughs> They're much more interesting. Yeah, but I live in Switzerland, <laughs> so I like the tunnel. <laughs> okay. Thank you.